Okay, good evening. Um, I also want to thank you first. Uh, it's, of course, Peter who guided us this way bit to be hosted here and to talk with you once again on this Caritas project. And I'm really happy to be here together with Gideon because it's true, I think that talking about this project um, has a lot to do with co-production rather than an architect fulfilling needs. And when we talk about co-production, you talk about a lot of people, and I think that's really the basic of this project. So if I talk about co-production, we're missing still today, um, first of all, the director of the psychiatric clinic here, as I think he is the main initiative taker of everything. But we also miss, like, the doctors, therapists, all the collaborators, and also at a certain height, those who live there, who have been, thanks to Gideon, and the way he processed the whole thing, have been involved in it. First thing I want to say about it is that I could say myself, I'm not yet ready with a project. And this is quite something strange to see as an architect, because we always deliver a result that is judged at a certain moment and then delivered, and then you, you lose it. And that's, a house is so long, our house, till the last day, and then we never enter it anymore, till, unless something happens with love or something. But, I mean, here we, we are still not ready with it, and even today, Gideon and I and the director are sharing the last weeks again tables to discuss and to debate how to move on with the project. This was the expectation from the beginning. And um, where I pick up the story, and Gideon will later on reverse and comment what I forgot to say and everything, and maybe what I wrongly say, because there are also diverse ideas on it. Uh, I pick up the story here at the moment that we entered the process. It was a moment of a competition. Competition that uh, Gideon proposed to that work group, saying that after half a year or a year debating on the future on psychiatry on that side, Gideon said we should have a test case. We should go to making something, to do something. And what is the occasion? Well, this is an image we produced for the competition entry, and I put it in the beginning. It's a kind of collage painting, way we like to process or to produce or represent ideas. And keep in mind that you have in the center where we talk about, the psychiatric clinic, the place, the old building called uh, Josef building today. And then you see white, kind like loggias over the image. Keep that in mind. So what it's exactly about, it's we entered with that image the competition. Maybe I have to give a little bit uh, history on it. This is an old image from that period it has been built. It's, I believe, 1908 it has been opened. And what you see here is, I think, and I understood, quite a revolutionary concept on psychiatry at that time. You see an open field, in fact, a kind of park you can walk in. And in the park, one has different types of buildings. Those buildings are related by their kind of architectural style, but they are similar and different. And all the buildings are related to a certain disease, to a certain psychosis, to a certain idea, to a certain treatment. And it looks lovely, though the topic is quite difficult. One has to imagine that, like, one year before, all the people who were invited now to come and live over there, psychiatric patients, lived in the old city of Ghent, in the middle of the city. And you can imagine uh, this was a condition which was middle-aged. And until then, in fact, psychiatry was more a question of locking up people than really treating people. So here around Ghent, we have two sites. There is another Gislain cult, and this is the Carita city. And this is at first for women, and the Gislain was for men. 
And it is based by a Catholic congregation, sisters. And uh, you can tell a lot of things about it. And for example, interesting was that even, for example, the economy of it was well worked out. So we talk about 10 years, 10, coming up 20s. Psychiatry or psychology was an upcoming, I would not say science, but almost a belief when we talk about the roaring 20s. A lot of ladies also love to go over the weekend to chill out or how you have to say. And even those buildings, some of them were for the rich people and other were for the poor people. And the rich people paid, in fact, the investment for the poor people. So this congregation was not only about taking care, but it was a well-defined plan. And so the whole site at that time was quite revolutionary in many other aspects. I don't want to stay too long with it, but you see now how how beautiful, how homogenic it all came over, and it was very balanced. It was very self-providing with vegetables and green gardens and everything. It was a kind of new world. We make, that's a bit D, I go to the model. We make a jump in time. After World War, things evolve. Also, luckily, again, Ideas on psychiatry do evolve. What happens quickly, if you look with me to backwards to the alt, you see a lot of buildings. And on this model, you only see few. Because a lot of the buildings had been demolished throughout the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, because a lot of ideas changed and they did not fit anymore in the volumetry of the existing buildings. Those buildings were not able to catch up with, on one hand, as such visions on psychiatry, on the other hand, also regulations, norms on psychiatry, and then subsequently also on subsidies on psychiatry, how to build buildings, because this is a whole system, of course. And you see then that they are replaced by this typically bodies, I could say, which more merely refer to real hospital organizations of nowadays, or at least the days of the 70s and the 80s. And each of them, in contrast to the original status of the park, each of them, let's say, take a little bit an architectural style, which was at that very moment nowadays. And it makes that, like in four decades, the whole unity disappeared and was replaced by a kind of what this, a little bit that, and something like this. When the competition was launched, Gideon and his work uh, group were um, at, that, at the next point. What happens? To, to make it a little bit black-white story, but to make it understandable is that when we look to this, this image, is it the, when we look to this image, you see here two buildings. Here was another building. It's not anymore on a model. And this building is a building we're going to talk about. It's the Caritas building. At the moment that there was a competition, or the competition was launched, one year ahead or two years ahead, the new director arrived at the venue. And he was confronted with the fact that they just had demolished completely the one over there, saying that they couldn't use it anymore as it was not accordingly nowadays expectations. And they were about demolishing this one. Well, they started the moment of stripping. Ah, can I scan? Ah, you don't see it, sorry. But, yeah, here, sorry. Here was a building which is demolished, demolished at that time. And then here you have the building we are talking about. Oh, but it's good. it went on its own already. Here we have the, the building we are talking about. So. When this director came in, this one was demolished, that they were stripping, all the roof tiles were picked away. It was raining inside, but they found asbestos. So the, 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 the director had a good argument to stop the building site and to lean back and say, yes, I'm not gonna debate about regulations and norms and expectations, but what I want to debate about is that we are at a huge speed demolishing a cultural heritage on one hand. On the other hand, that at that time, 
he, they was, or he was also confronted two or three years ago, and it's still going on, with huge questioning on how architecture for psychiatric clinics, but maybe an extent for all clinics, but especially for psychiatric clinics, what could you expect about it? How different could you think about it? Maybe and such and so on. So he stopped it, he had this excuse, and he started a workshop in which then, and Gideon will explain that later, Gideon was invited to become the motor of the workshop to talk, bring everyone together. Till that moment that then Gideon decided uh, to present to the workshop, now this building is there abandoned. And it was, in fact, the building of which they talked constantly when they talked about, when they talked about um, all these ideas. So they launched a small competition. And the brief of the competition was something like this. It said, like, as the building has already a status of being half demolished, not half, but the demolishing started, the architects should consider on what they could do with it. They didn't give a plan, they didn't give a program, they didn't give a functionality. They just said, if you say we have to demolish it because you can't do anything with it, just advise us. But on the other hand, think about it and tell us what eventually we can do with it. So our competition entry started with that first image, which you saw, and one of the models was uh, this model. But in fact, we say always that we give three answers, though there was only one question launched. The question was, what to do with that building? But the first thing we answered was what you see on this model. We first wanted to think about a kind of idea of the whole site, though it was not a topic of the competition. And I show you now the building as we found it. So all the tiles are gone. Here is a big hole because the bulldozer drove in it. Here you see a kind of yeah, veranda, extra building they must have built in the 60s, 70s maybe. And we made a catalog of the whole site. And we looked around and we did simple observations. And what we saw was the collection of the images I show you right now. Like every other building had, well, sometime still an or original, maybe not from the first years, but or quite original loggia. And then you had at many other places, kind of small canopies like this one, or also somewhere from the 60s, a kind of rounded extra volume or the strange forms which you could find back in the latest production. And the first thing we proposed, so we said like we first, before we talk about the building, we want to propose a kind of strategy to reunite the whole site. No budget was foreseen, whatever, it's not been executed right now, but it's still in the mind. To say like, if we take into account again this beautiful old loggia, why could we not add new ones? And not in addition, but mostly because we just reinterpret given elements on site. And the idea was that we will be not able to restore for once and forever again that unity in architecture. But on the other hand, we restore that idea of having a park landscape with canopies, with loggias, as people walk around daily, that becomes a kind of new alphabet throughout the site. Second thing we answered, though it was not a question, was that we said, the question you raised is that much specific, namely no program, no real ideas, that we believe that it is possibly not possible to give an answer with an endpoint. So what we entered for them a little bit and expected was this tall model, a kind of puppet house. A puppet house, which at first, when they looked at it, they saw it and they said, well, maybe nothing happened. If I see, yeah, they saw immediately that this was gone and it became what we 
presented in the first part of the answer. And the idea of the puppet house was not only, as it always is interesting to make models, to show off what you, were, what you are going to do, to explain the idea, but also we underlined that the model was there as an instrument of process. That we expected that throughout the next time, the project had to evolve, and, and for many reasons. Of course, we are working with a building which is, I would say, it's raining inside, so it will not get better. There will be a kind of deterioration throughout the time, so we have to keep an eye on it and make decisions together. On the other hand, as they wanted, let's say, I would not say experimental room to test one and another, but rather space to explore together with their patients and therapists and on. We were convinced or we thought that subconsequently they should check, they should learn, and possibly it needed to change quite soon, quite quickly, or maybe after two years, after five years, or whatever. So the model there also was for us to underline that we were ready to accept the idea that this was not about making a building, with a deadline or with a delivery, and that's off. So we wanted to have a puppet house in which we could play, and that went together along with sketches, drawings. Again, we presented to say, like, well, this is also the way we want to communicate. This is the way we want to work with you, to think about space, and so on. So this was, in fact, the second answer, though there was no question about it. But we thought this was key to the evolution or the way we should approach the project. Only the third answer was, in fact, the only answer which was an answer towards a question. What do you do with what is today or at that moment over there? And those are images the way we found it. It was raining inside. Plaster work was really gotten rotten. Ceilings were pending because of the load of the rain that was inside. We even got um, later on uh, meetings in it with patients and so on, but that's another story. Anyway, this is how it was when the competition was held. I showed you model and so on. I will not go precise in the ideas of the competition, but I can tell you right now that yet, thanks to the model, Yet, thanks to the process with Gideon, of course, many ideas changed, not opposite to the one we presented, but just changed little places, venues, ideas into the building. And it was quite an experience to do it, also for me as an architect, to be honestly, though the perfect organization they had with a work group and Gideon, still the confrontation with an other type of client was something. Um, I cannot speak out the many moments we've met because that's, that's of course, uh, an intimate uh, affair. But it's for an architect quite something to be like two hours together with a patient, with a white paper, and trying to draw out ideas and things. Anyway, I make now the swift or the switch, I think. Gideon will tell you more about processing and everything towards how the building looks like today. This is an image, again, of which you could say what's the difference, but then, if you look at it, of course, you see it. On one hand, the tiles were off, as it was done by the demolition, and that's not a difference. Still, rain goes inside. But here you see maybe what was on that first painting image. The first loggia has been realized. The upstands has been demolished, taken away, and from now on, the whole project is a kind of open project. Not only in this additional part from the 60s or 70s, I don't know, but also the, all the windows around, all the window sills has been taken over. And what you see here is the line of the new ground floor. The ground floor inside is not anymore limited to the outskirts of the building but has been taken or waved out into the park. If we go closer, 
you start to see other things also, like small greenhouses. I will talk about any minute. Even if we come more close, you see how we have been treating the building. Of course, all plaster work has been taken away so that it could not be filled with water and humidity. All ceilings have been taken away, except of this white first part where we talk about the concrete structure. All uh, wooden floors are free to breathe and to, for long as they are possibly can do, still stay usable. The floor has been taken away and has been replaced by pebbles. That means that all rain that comes inside just drains away. And now the building looks like a little bit a walking animal onto a pink or red plateau of pebbles. And by that, there the building, we believe, breaks the idea of being on one hand a building and opens, on the other hand, the idea of being a public space. Those are the simple ideas, in fact. What we wanted or what we presented was saying, okay, let's stay as long as possible with the building as it is. We know throughout the time we will have to invest or interfere or come in between because certain parts will become worse and worse. So I would say maybe within two, three years, we take away the whole structure of the wood, of the roof. But it doesn't matter. As for so long, we have a space in which we can explore things in a different way. On the other hand, we also took immediately care of restoring the building. For example, you can see here the way where the bulldozer went through. And later on, they took away bricks because they wanted to use the bricks for restoration of other parts of other buildings on site. We had to restore it again. And we wanted to restore it with an economy. But not only with an economy. Well, the economy is, of course, that it's not about restoration as it was ever but it was about replacement with a new or a different type of material that on one hand could be pragmatically worked out, on the other hand also helped to clear out what happened with the building throughout time. So this was something for us, which was another way to look not only to psychiatry, but also giving the certain limits of budgets available a way of approaching, a way of working. So on one hand, it's clear. On the other hand, it's pragmatic. But maybe even more important is that we never drew a detail of it. We just give the principle to the contractor and said like, well, and you're going to see it in other images also, well, if you have to restore structural parts of the building because it was damaged at many, at many points, you just should use this concrete block and you should really knit it in it. So it becomes a clear scarf. We turn now into the building. On the left side, you just see a glimpse of the white loggia you were looking at. Here, left above, you also see a small glimpse of this kind of ongoing concrete network that brings things together. And that became also for us the idea of how the contractor should move on with everything. So when we were on the building side and the debate came, how, when we take a wooden floor away, how will we treat it? We treated it like that. We just cut it off and we keep the trace to show off what the real original status of the building was. For one time, we were not responsible for adding metal beams. We just painted them green as always, and that's another story I will not tell or not talk about. But here you see what happens in the heart of the building. So we opened some floors to bring rain and light downstairs. We added some glazed volumes to give abilities to use the buildings, let's say, in a kind of in-between seasonal condition. Nothing is heated, nothing is climatized, nothing is is, um, is a conditioned. There is only a little bit water available and also Wi-Fi connection. But it means that the use of the building is limited, but maybe just by its limits, it is also giving new opportunities. It is 
not really used in winter. It is definitely used in summer and especially explored in the in-between seasons. Like this early in-between season of today, it helps to bring people down to it. How it is used is differently. We can give you examples from the board of the hospital having their meetings over there in better conditions. We can talk about uh, some therapists giving drawing classes. But what we especially have to understand is that even in this case, if you would say, like in any other building, let's make an overview on the functional use and time of the building, it's almost impossible to say how it really functions. Some therapists told me, like, you know, for some patients, being only five minutes here, it's enough. It's not that they then have enough with the building, but it's not fitting in the way of psychosis and so on. But it is very important to have been here five minutes. In the weekend, you have family visiting relatives, and I talk about parents there, young or even childs, or children their parents. Environment in which today not... I have to say it's not any more feminine psychiatry that does not exist anymore, so exclusive. It's everyone, also kids. If I look with you around, we turn over. You've seen that we've taken away the floor, or not yet seen, I point at it, that we've taken away the floor between the basement and the ground floor. We entered a tree to make clear it's a park. We used light posts like they were all around in the park. And then, for example, you have there in the corner the old chimney of the technical heating room below, which we just broke open and made a fireplace about. It's this place where every evening or almost every evening the youngsters come together, put on the fire and just smoke a cigarette. Sometimes throw away the chair with a brick or whatever. It doesn't matter. It all can stand it, even the broken window, once in a while. This is, I think, the only thing what maybe the client was looking for, the undefined use. This is maybe the only thing that we, as an architect, were hoping to add that moment that it becomes a point de refere for youngsters and how they gather. I cannot say exactly which hour they arrive and which hour they leave and what they exactly going to do. But for the first time, they have at this venue a place to connect. And if you come over there and you are there only 15 minutes, you might be disappointed to not have met anyone. If you stay like four hours or three hours, you might be astonished and yes, sometimes structurally a therapist or doctor passes by with a group of people and tries to set up some experiments, sometimes successful, sometimes less successful, or sometimes you just see walking people in and out and being wondering and doing some things I cannot describe and, and that's it. But it becomes an anchor point in the whole park where people come to or where other people like the director also said there are people who walk around with a huge bow because they are scared. I learned that, um, well, I learned, I, maybe I could also imagine it before, but it, it explicitly learned more clear what space does with psychosis and so on and the relation and so on. Here you have now a small auditorium. There is a small nursery school connected and they also love to come over there when better conditions to have a class outside. So it are all undefined uses. Sometimes they are on an agenda scheme uh, because they have to, to, to order the space. But very often they are totally unorganized. Functionality use 100%? Not at all. But maybe that only 15 or 20 percent compared to other buildings, those 15 and 20 percent, 200 percent of useful or enjoyable or meaningful environment. Was it worth doing it? 
Well, it costs more than demolishing it. But on the other hand, demolishing delivered a green grass field. And then it was nothing. At this moment, sometimes the director, in a good move moment, he says, well, and maybe within 10 years, I make a new administrative building out of it. It doesn't matter, as long as we can have ideas on it. And sometimes we are doubtful, and the other times everyone says, no, you see, it proves itself. But I believe this is very interesting, to be on that wave of movement now, again, today, to, to, to steer it into other directions very soon. As I said, we are gathering today again with the director and the team to redefine things and to replace some floors and to take some floors away, as it was foreseen, taking them away because they are deteriorating more. On the other hand, they are, have no use and they take light away from another part and so on. So uh, many meaning reasons, interventions will be changing the building within one and a half year. We're going to put a glass house outside because they want to have also a glass house outside and a little bit more space to organize other activities. This was from the beginning. And what you see here is, again, this kind of way we treat it as an architect, this building. Not with building details ahead. Later on, I've been drawing them by hand all. Or, for example, this small moment that came with us, taking away the wooden widow cells, a little bit destroying by that the wall, having to pour a little bit concrete, and then on a blue sky day with white clouds deciding to paint them white. And then the contractor came, his daughter came, and she took the whole Easter vacation to paint them all white. It's a small story again, but I do believe it's a lot of those stories that makes that we believe that the building today or the whole project as such has a value of which I say today, I'm still not ready with it. I see the tremendous values and I'm still wondering and taking care and getting nervous of other values we can find again by stretching, changing and so on, working with the building. It's now the time, almost two years after the first use. So here you see some pictures of the way how we moved the lost baluster we replaced by a concrete brick wall, you can guess. This project became for us as a practice, if I don't talk about the psychiatry as such, well, every project is special for us, that's why we make it and that's why I believe we make what you might know what we make. But of course this project at many points also had to redefine or recalibrate our own thinking on architecture. Not a building that is delivered. Not a building that will grow, but maybe will get smaller at a certain point. Not a building that might be always what we see right now. Maybe it changes in the future. And there has been a, already ideas, luckily they passed, of opening a brasserie, whatever. But that's something special for us, to me. And... Strangely, this, well, not strangely, uh, yeah, we are lucky our work is picked up quite often, and this project was picked up also. And um, it led it, uh, we are now uh, two years ago, summer two years ago, uh, to a question that came from uh, uh, the Grafton architects, being curating, curators of the Venice Biennale 2018 under the team Free Space, and they wrote us a letter and says like, well, we think that your project has something to do with the word Free Space. Could you think about it and could you present it? We got quite an important spot in the um, Giardini. And what I show you right now are some um, uh, conceptual drawings, design drawings, and this is, I think, one of the key ones. I don't know if you had been able to visit it, but the presentation of it consisted out of rooms. And the rooms were like size, a little bit referring to the early cabinet rooms that were in that building, small cabinets in which the people were sleeping with not too much privacy and so on. Anyway, on one hand, it referred to it, but let's say that's a far reference. 
On the other hand, it became a structure of wooden beams, small beams, on which we could present all the images of Philippe Dujardin, of which you have seen a selection just before, on quite a tall and large scale, and only with the aim on what you see right now here, that from certain viewpoints, when you move to the presentation, you might see different scenery, scenographs of the building at the same time. A little bit, an experience like when you stroll through the building today. So those are kind of like conceptual drawings, just to show you how it happened. <clears throat> there have been variant organizations at the end. We are very happy to have built it the way you have seen, or you might have seen it on photographs. And the structure we use, the wooden structure, are the future planks of the restorations of the floors, or let's say of some floors. So also for us, this was a small idea on bringing things in relation with each other. On one hand, the project came to Venice. We needed budget, we needed material to build it up, and then that material later on went or goes or is now back on site on the venue, and soon we will start to replace floors or parts of floors, change positions of floors even to go into a next use of the building. Anyway, I show that. And then those are the photographs of what you've seen on sketches or if you've seen in reality, you recognize on the left hand this photograph I started up to show of the realization. And this is a little bit the scenography of what was our presentation in, at the Venice Biennale 2018 this summer. And now it will come back to Belgium and it will be on show from October on, I believe, in Kunsthal in Ghent, together with the other organization, organized together with the other psychiatric organization, Gislain. And this wood asset is now back in um, Caritas, where we will use it to change the building soon, as I have said. And I think you can confirm what I say to you. There is a scenography of seeing one after the other, like if you had the occasion to visit the building already, you might experience when you're on site. Of course, never is something as good as being on site, but at least it gives a certain or it gives a certain um, complexity, scenography, vision into how it is on site. I have to say I told you that we are today gathering again to rethink the project. I do believe also that the Venice Biennale, and that's again something thanks to Gideon, was also the first moment to rethink the project. And that led it, sorry, I didn't know I had so many pictures of the Venice Biennale in it. <laughs> I should clear that out for the next time. And that led it to, at the same time of the Venice Biennale, and making a small workbook. Uh, this workbook has the name Unless Other People. It's a size A5. It's the second one in a range we are setting up. The previous was the other Venice Biennale, Bravour, Scarcity, Beauty. Unless Other People is, I think, quite a good title for what has happened over there. Whatever we do as architects, at the end, it's always about people. And this workbook, has been mainly uh, edited by Gideon. But what is nice to tell about is that you see again all those photos on the right side of the spread. And on the left side, you have the text and all kind of things that come together. And those texts are written by everyone. It's not an architecture book with crits of distinguished architects, theorists or whatever. It has been written by doctors, by the director, by students in architecture, by us, by Gideon, of course. And it contains a kind like text which reflects on it. Yosef is a moment. And I just was here with Gideon two hours ahead as we are now setting up the organization of, we are not sure, some school or semester school for students of architecture in which we might start from rereading this book and trying to re-debate all the things that have been said. And nice to me is that the book also contains yet now today 
quite some comments on the project. It's not only about, which I can understand, seeing this as a marvelous project, this is also putting already comments and ideas, like, are we using it yet in a good way? Could we use it in another way? And I just want to hold to two seconds with this, again, a spread of the book. And for one time, you see on the left side also another project which is on site. You could say after a point, at a certain point, like what this director has been doing with this project, not the director, but everyone, okay, it's fine, it's interesting, it's marvelous, it's unbelievable, but is it a singular hit? What does it mean for all the other things? And luckily those people over there, to me, that's the amazing point. They are really rethinking at any time and at any moment things on how to deal with space. And it's, if I told you in the beginning of the conference that they demolished at a high speed all those buildings because they could not be used anymore accordingly nowadays regulation, normations, and then subsequently subsidies, there was one like of pervert element <laughs> that is that you could get subsidies for new buildings 100%. And if you wanted to renovate buildings, you needed to be 70% of the new build. 70, wasn't it? Or 75. 75%. And one of the unspoken... Huh? It's true, huh? Yes, yes, but logic was reversed. Yeah, yeah. So we only pay you 100% yeah, when to go for the yeah. new building. And if not for the renovation, only yeah. 75 percent. That's what I meant. Yeah. So okay. There's no in between. And mostly the architects who were at, still then on stage said, "Yeah, you can never do this for 75 percent of the value of the 100 percent." That's why they were always demolished. Well, here the director and his technical team, the building team from on site, they did a renovation of this building at a price of 60 percent, I believe, of the new build. And how they did it, and now you have to stretch your head a little bit because it is, uh, it's a spread of a book. And I only have one image. I should have had more images. They did it themselves in a very simple way. They went to a very nice designer of chairs and, and simple uh, tables and benches, and then they added, and you can't see it on this photo, there is another one, old furniture they bought at a second flea market. And it gave the building a really nice simple environment. Okay, there are maybe no architectural ideas, uh, which are really, but if you look at it, and if I would have some other images, sorry for it, you would say, it's a living room, it's a nice house, it's an open house, and everyone feels spa feel free in it. So I, I wanted to stop here two minutes on it, because the whole idea of what happens with the building that I came to explain now for 45 minutes, is not only a singular point. It is an ongoing thinking they have on site to try to think differently with needs, urge, money, ideas on psychiatry. Anyway, so the book fills itself uh, with 100 pages, not something like this, full with ideas. And those ideas we would like to take soon from summer or later, second part of the year, to become the starting point for the next commenting on how we eventually could move on. And in that sense, I, I stay with that last image, which is the backside of the book, and less other people. I think it's a good moment, Gideon, to take over here the words and to comment my words, because that's exactly how we work together. <laughs> So I'm happy to, uh, let's say, make some footnotes to the presentation of uh, Jan. I will uh, stress seven moments in the architectural production of what you have seen uh, here, uh, presented by Jan. The marvelous design they did together with uh, Inge and uh, Jo. Um, Jan already explained this uh, layout of the psychiatric clinic of Caritas, built in 1908 as an anti or as a sort of counterpart to the men's facility in, to, in the city center. This was 
um, organized by the Sisters of Mercy. The men were organized by the Brothers of uh, Mercy. Um, so here I show you some uh, images. The production site, you have the Josef building here at the left of the image. This was in 1958, uh, so not at the origin of the center. It's what they call the Flemish Fair. So at one moment uh, in the year, of course, this was, was not happening every day. Um, it would have been a harsh discipline. It was only at the Flemish Fair, so one day in the year. There was an open day. The two villages around the center, Mel and Meerbeke, came, let's say, to the, to the center to see how uh, people were uh, cured in the facility. So, but here is uh, where my, let's say, uh, entry in the psychiatric center uh, started with this image. This is an image I found at the, uh, or you could say it was a found object. This was circulating in the board and the management uh, rooms. Um, um, I was asked in 2014, summer 2014, to uh, reflect and to, or to set up a vision development on the architectural and spatial qualities of the psychiatric center. I must say it was a miscast. I mean, I was not busy with that uh, at that time. I was writing on architecture. I was doing theory as I was introduced by Peter as philosopher architect. This was my main business. Of course, I had expertise in architecture of, for psychiatry, but mainly in studying, doing case studies and writing. The director somehow miscasted me and said, asked me this, let's say, to do the vision development for the master uh, plan. Uh, I, but um, I accepted, or accepted, I said, I want, I, I glad, I'm glad to, to take the, let's say, the commission on one, on, uh, one condition, is that you put everybody together at the table, because I'm not the expert, of course I have knowledge on this whole issue, but it's not up to me to find what the spatial architecture and spatial of the center will be like. This is something that only the users uh, can come up with. So we put together work groups with psychiatrists, management, personnel, staff, and patients, all, all in the different, let's say, treatment programs. One group for the psychosis care, one group for the neuro neurosis care, one group for the children psychiatry, one group for the elderly psychiatry psychiatry and all of that. So we were discussing uh, wh what it was like to live or to be in that uh, center, what, it, what, it, what architecture meant uh, for their situation as either patient or staff and all of that. Or something everybody was somehow complaining about, not only patients but also staff was, let's say, this empty field of green. So the, every, in the psychiatric center, every building has one specific uh, function. So you have the restaurant, you have the management building and all of that. So a lot of people were uh, complaining that the moment you uh, leave that one building you're staying in, you enter this empty sea of green. You, don't, you have no uh, destination to head to. And there's simply, there is simply nothing in the, city, uh, in the psychiatric center uh, where you can address yourself to. So this was one very a very uh, prominent idea when people were reflecting upon what is architecture, what does space mean being in the center. It was the empty space of green. Of course, there were a lot of other ideas, but this one, this one idea was very specific because I don't have to tell you that patients are, let's say, have specific difficulties in roaming around in, in, in this kind of spaces. Uh, it led to the specific situation that a lot of patients stick to the door. S smoking is the main business in psychiatry. This is what everybody does. So what are, where are the people smoking? It's at the door of the, the facility where they stay. And this is, let's say, they have a very small, very limited uh, oxy, uh, 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 room for uh, a rooming space. So let me take this specific uh, ID, this is the, the empty sea of green or the empty ocean of green space. And th because this will lead us to uh, the story. There was an, something else I have to explain entering. Uh, we had to think of, let's say, the architectural and spatial qualities for the psychiatric um, 
center. Uh, but the framework of the whole investigation was a demolition plan. A actually, the central axis of the building of the site was up for demolition. Contracts were already signed. In fact, the buildings were still there, but they were already gone from the mental map of the management. So we were talking about. So here we have the Josef building. This is the building we are talking about this evening. You had the Lente building, was also up for demolition. The Gislain building was demolished while we were having the workshops. It took one week to take the building down. It took another week to clear the site and to, to sort the grass again. Also, the Wasserei, the laundry, was up for demolition. So four buildings in a row. For, for these buildings, these contracts were already signed with the contractor. And then there was still doubt whether all these other buildings, the Getijden, the technical service, the Branding, which was the closed forensic psychiatry building, whether they were still functional. But anyhow, I mean, this was something very unclear, a, mis a sort of mystical uh, future. So this, this was, in fact, the framework of our work. Um, but part of the, let's say, having all this discussion with the people, uh, a lot of people uh, with patients, uh, staff and all of that, a lot of, were, a lot of people were complaining of this one, uh, the demolition of this one building, St. Joseph. This, this was a building very prominent on, on site. As you see, it was here opposite to the restaurant. So everybody coming all over from the psychiatric center to have dinner in the, at noon or lunch, uh, they could see what happened with the St. Joseph building. So it was already standing idle for years, closed. But so the moment uh, demolition works started, it created something of a, uh, of a stress. Um, it was in that situation that I asked the director or to, I proposed to the director to have a photography project. I mean, the argument was if you demolish a building, you do it with respect. So let's, let's, photo, let's make a sort of photography project of, of the building taking it down. Uh, I must say, I only invited my friend, photographer Stein Bollard, only one time. And after that, the whole process started to uh, reverse. But anyhow, so this was the building uh, Gislaine, two weeks to demolish it. And this was the St. Joseph uh, building. What happened in, let's say, discussing the, uh, that photography project is that suddenly we realized in the workshops that all ideas, all qualities that we defined for the master plan uh, were somehow or could be reflected upon that one building. So, for instance, or one of the main requests by the management was that they wanted to have an, a central activity space in the, or central meeting uh, space in the psychiatric center. And it suddenly at the work, at the, in the workshops, the idea was, What's the sense of thinking of a new meeting ground on this spot while you have something that could be used for that uh, matter? Of course, there were other uh, fantasies uh, circling around that building. Uh, when we were discussing a possible future for this building with people in the elderly care, an old lady said, why don't you make a wailing wall out of it? You know, a wailing wall like in Jerusalem, where you, uh, <laughs> where you put messages um, in between the big stones. But then the ladies next to her, an elderly lady, uh, was sipping from her coffee saying, hmm, there's enough wailing here in the psychiatric center. Give me a wishing wall. Of course, this, this, this fantasy of a wishing wall became something very vital in discussing some, a, a possible future for this uh, one building. There were other ideas. And the youngsters, of course, they had ideas. They, they wanted to, to, to play hide and seek in the building, paintball, whatever. So everybody had this, this specific ideas of what could we do in a possible reuse of this building. In fact, the, the project definition was a sort of project definition. We were not even talking about the project at that moment. It was more 
imagine if you do something with that building under demolition, what could, what could you do? What would you dream of doing there? We put it all together and this, uh, let's say, and it became a sort of, this bricolage of desire became a sort, a sort of agency in itself, suddenly making everybody enthusiastic of keeping uh, that uh, building. As Jan told, the, the, the moment the contractor found asbestos in the building was a sort of perfect moment to have a standstill and to have create a sort of reflection uh, in the management. It allowed me to bargain further with the management and saying, if the demolition costs 200,000 euros, I can do better with that. So, I mean, it's enough to, to pay the photographer, but why don't you leave some stones on site? So this was a bit of the idea. So uh, why not making a sort of fairground, as they still do, the yearly fairground, uh, with but some of the runes, some, some stones left on site. So the, the point was 200,000 euros, I can do, or we can do better uh, with that. It was in fact this specific idea that we put into, um, or from which we composed the project definition that in, uh, for which we uh, started or launched a limited uh, competition. I show you this because it was part of my strategy. We published already the ideas even before it was decided by the board of, director, board of directors because it helped them to, let's say, uh, to, um, how do you call that? Uh, ah, never mind. Uh, it helped them to get used to the idea of keeping uh, the building. So we launched an... Uh, so first we had this, the master, uh, the master plan, this was the bigger context. The second was, let's say, this euthanasia of the built, uh, or the heritage that was already uh, decided. The buildings were still there, but were in fact already gone, uh, mentally. And third, this, um, this limited competition, it was more on invitation to three officers to pr present a sketch uh, for for an, uh, in, uh, in answer to a project definition that was broadly defined um, as an open monumental space. And then in that open monumental space or that monumental outdoor space uh, connected with, with all these different ideas, the fairground for the director, the wishing wall, the railing wall, the, the, the space to, hide, uh, to play hide and seek for the youngsters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here, this uh, Hang the Smet Paul Vermeulen uh, architects from Ghent, they presented this idea. They demolished actually, or they, they somehow followed the idea of a ruin, but then they created a closed uh, a house from one of the wings of the building. This was the, the dollhouse uh, presented by the Vildevink Tailleur. And this was the design sketch made by Noah Architects. It created a lot of discussion among the, uh, the management and the board. In fact, strangely enough, this, this design was too closely following the project definition uh, for a sort of English landscape ruin. Uh, with the, the design proposal by the Wilde Vinctoe was definitely the most provocative and therefore the most hardest to endure. And still, somehow it was, in fact, what we had in mind, because even this project definition, creating an English ruin, a monumental outdoor space, was not, was not, not something intentional. It was not that, let's say, people wanted that idea. In fact, the proposal to, to take the building as found, somehow fitted this, this constant progress of ideas, progress of ideas in the sense of the building was already gone, so why not uh, leaving some si stones on site to create a fairground? Uh, this was a sort of next step. So, uh, of course, it took a lot of time and negotiation with the board to convince all these people, but in fact, this was the in a sense, the, when you take through all the ideas that were discussed in the uh, work groups 
uh, around the master plan. This was the somehow the result of it. Uh, <clears throat> provocative, but it somehow posed this very, let's say, this question whether you dare to keep the building, to, whether you dare to create a destination in this empty space of green, et cetera, et cetera, whether you dare to uh, create that wishing wall for this one uh, elderly lady. These were the work groups uh, on site, was inside the St. Joseph building. This was uh, the moment we were already uh, working the uh, through the design with uh, Jan de Wilde, Inge Vink and Jo Tailleu. We created again, or we brought together again the, the psychiatrists, psychologists, patients, board pe uh, people from the board, the head psychiatrist is in the back. These are images from the opening of the building. It brings up this question of use. What's the use of the building? Of course, how, how can you monitor the use in such an uh, environment? The use, and on, in this specific moment of an open, open, open day, it works, of course, wonderful. These are images uh, from uh, something much more uh, difficult to, uh, to monitor, let's say, the use. These were the, uh, a group of patients in psychosis care. So somehow the building um, fit the, the, the therapy, if I must say, uh, of the, um, of to help these people to get acquainted in different feelings of, let's say, being open or being or being inside, being outside, being inside while being outside. So patients in that uh, specific uh, situation have difficulties in, in dealing with these oppositions. So they, the, the psychologists are using the, the furniture, not for what it was meant. So as Jan explained, the, the greenhouse had to function as a sort of uh, activity space. Well, in this specific situation, it, it helped the patients to, let's say, to, to get a grip on what is hard matter uh, or soft matter and matter where you can look through and matter where you cannot look through, etc., etc. This is an, an image of a, a very late evening in which I uh, visit the site with two friends. Inside, one lady was walking around and started to complain against me or to me about the ugly designs uh, put on the wall of this cellar. I, I proposed to her uh, provocatively, this is, a, this, is a, this is exactly what the white walls are waiting for, to, you know, to put something on it. So the, when I came back, few weeks later, she designed something on the wall. It's not very clear. It's a sort of rainbow, you are my sunshine. A bit pathetic, but anyhow, so this was, she put her name on it and with a date, as if she was uh, the artist. In fact, these were the users, uh, or in, it is in this image that I somehow so realized that the wishing wall, the elderly lady have been talking about or was dreaming about. She told me that she, she made a walk in the building every evening uh, before uh, the night curfew uh, was announced. So we, we, here we have a bit of an uh, assembler of everything. Jan already told about this one building, uh, the Lente. It was called before the Lente. In the back you see the Josef building. Here on the right you see this typical modernist uh, or pseudo-modernist buildings uh, created around the millennium. This is something important because, uh, in fact, what happened is that also this building got saved from the demolition plan. Also for this uh, uh, building, let's say the, the contract was renegotiated with a, a demolition contractor. 
why, why this building is so important in the working of the hospital is that, in fact, the building, uh, the open building, the building designed by the Ville de does not solve anything. Uh, I mean, of course, it is a, it's a sort of wonderful space. Uh, it creates a lot of fantasies. It is used or not used. People walk around uh, it or not. I mean, but in fact, it does not solve anything. The, the Catholic congregation is not even paid or subsidized to make buildings like that. Uh, in fact, this building, or I find it important, this building, because it is a sort of outcome of the whole process we went through with the Yulsev building, designed by the Ville de Vink Tailleux. In fact, this is the true... Uh, um, or true. This is a solution that came uh, out of this whole process. Uh, while where the, while the the Yosef building again does not solve anything, it attracts all attentions, whether positive or not. Uh, while in this uh, instance, uh, it it shows how the the clinic, the psychiatric center, uh, organized with our own means but uh, working with their own technical service to redo this whole building as Jan explained for only 60 percent of a newly built uh, facility again what you see here is in, in fact what we discussed in the master plan work groups the needs the spatial needs for psych people or patients suffering psychosis had to do with let's say high ceilings, open spaces, a lot of light entering the building, having the possibility to, to leave the building through different exits, uh, uh, creating a building that has no corridors, because corridors uh, are, how so, are somehow suffocating. Uh, suddenly, having gone through this whole process of the St. Joseph building, people started to realize, in fact, this old building was maybe perfect to organize psychosis care inside. So the old central bathrooms became the living rooms of an ensemble in which you have no corridor anymore. And then the former cabinets of the, uh, let's say, psychiatrists, psychologists, and all of that became this, the individual uh, sleeping rooms with very short corridors. Short corridors in the sense that here we have the entry to the level, and then you have a corridor of, of only three uh, doors. This is something totally different than the buildings. Uh, you saw them on the small model that Jan de Vilder uh, showed. The new buildings in this pseudo-modernist style is a sort of collection of corridors. Corridors that have, let's say, mirrored uh, doors. This is a typical uh, clinic building. So also the clinic buildings you have been visiting for whatever uh, reason. These kind of spaces, uh, or do not calm down the patients on the country, they, it creates a sort of uh, absolute uh, fear because there's mirroring of uh, windows, because there is no view to the outside anymore, because there is no exit anymore to the uh, uh, area around. So in fact, but at a certain moment, the clinic realized this building is in fact everything what we have been dreaming of uh, for psychosis uh, care. So these are in fact, I didn't uh, follow my numbering very strictly, but seven moments which were essential in the architectural production of the building that was presented by Jan. Uh, I end with this because it's sort of legacy that goes beyond the sublime object, the legacy of the project that was uh, uh, the open monumental uh, space is in fact uh, here. This is a legacy that, that could have not been realized without uh, doing the open uh, space. But today, in fact, Jan said he was getting nervous of what to do with this space. I must say everybody's quite nervous of what to do with it. The, the care manager, at an, uh, in a good moment, he said, in fact, everybody had a, at this moment has a certain opinion about the building. And this is the good thing about it. So one may like it, the other may like it not. But, uh, but the, 
the good thing about this building is at least that the architecture of the clinic is, is very present uh, at this moment. Before, architecture and space was something of the unconscious of the clinic, which is quite uh, cynical. You're in a psychiatric uh, situation. And then, I mean, discussing everything, discuss, discussing all traumas, all problems of people. But the architecture in which that happens is somehow part of the unconscious. It, it comes and go. You, you, you take a building down, you build it anew, and everybody has to adapt somehow. I mean, nobody is really taking care of that architecture. So everybody in a certain stress today, not only architects, also the psychiatric clinic itself also, for the moment, first and second floor is closed um, or because of uh, safety reasons. At a certain moment, um, or now having all this attention on the building, having received uh, awards and silver lines, of course, being very happy with that, but a lot of comments are going in the direction of people asking me, but I, I was there. And I found nobody. There was nobody in the space. Uh, of course, this is sort of architectural neurosis that people want to see, uh, let's say, use in the building, want to see people moving uh, around. Um, the point is, of course, that people going to that building, visiting, visiting it, somehow uh, do not understand that they are themselves uh, the user of the building if only by seeing it in Venice or seeing it or reading it in an architectural magazine. Why? From the very beginning, one of the, discussing the master plan, one of the uh, ambitions of the psychiatric center is to re-socialize, to open up that uh, closed environment. So the old plan is very typical. It's built outside of Ghent in the village of Melle. It's not even part of the village of Melle. It's outside the village of Melle. And then, of course, part of the official policy is to re-socialize psychiatry. It means that people that are at the end of treatment should be put uh, in, the, uh, in the centers of the village, etc., etc. What we started to think of is how, how can we create a sort of reversed re-socialization? Because it's, it's, of course, good to, to let's say, to bring patients back into the city center and the centers of the village, but it doesn't solve anything for the psychiatric center itself. So we were thinking of possibilities of creating a destination in the psychiatric center, not only for patients, but also for people like you and me. Uh, of course, this was not so, uh, not so easy because you're in this very uh, remote uh, location. Um, I, rem I, I remember very well also, again, this care manager saying that at a certain moment there was a bus of Italian architecture students arriving. They came from Mendrisio. He said it was like a little earthquake going through the facility, through the, through the psychiatric center. I mean, not only patients, of course, were somehow disturbed, but also staff could not imagine that their that the place where they have been working already for years was, became suddenly an attraction point for people from the outside. Which was strange, of course, because as I said, they have been, we have been discussing whether we could open up the sports hall to invite the local scouts group or sports group or whatever. And of course, in the end, it never happened. But then, uh, what happened was suddenly this, let's say, all the attention from architects uh, all over, architecture students arriving with buses. And again, it created a little earthquake uh, through the city, uh, through the psychiatric center. And maybe this was, um, let's say, where this is the moment where the whole story uh, uh, started asking the question how can we reverse the resocial or create a reversed resocialization in the psychiatric center? Thank you.